Tonight's Bible reading is from James chapter 4, verses 11 to 17. That's James 4, 11 to 17. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him or speaks against the law uh, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, we ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone, then, who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Good evening. You are all spread out again uh, nicely <laughs> this evening. I don't know about you, but that was a very confronting video. And I think it just highlights or reminds us of the complacency we get into as a church, doesn't it? When you think that there are people who are dying just to meet for church, and here we are, not under any kind of threat of persecution, and there are people who just long to have a Bible. How many Bibles do you own? We take a lot for granted in the Western world, the freedoms that we have. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are humbled in your sight. We want to acknowledge your greatness. We want to acknowledge your presence here with us. We know that you are in the midst of us. And we want to pray that we would not ignore what you are saying to us this evening. Sometimes it's easy for us when we hear your word preached to sometimes come in and out, drift in and out, and we pray this evening that you would keep us attentive through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we ask that as your word is expounded, that you would enable us to hear your voice to us this evening, not to ignore it, not to look at others, but to ask ourselves what it is that you are saying to us individually. And we ask that you would enable us to be proactive in applying your word into our lives. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. A man was out of town on a trip, and he asked his brother to take care of the cat for him while he was away. It's always a problem when you've got pets. You've got to give them over to someone when you're away. The cat was a beautiful Siamese and meant a great deal to the man, although his brother, who was caring for the cat, didn't like cats at all. When he got back from the trip, he called his brother's house and asked about the cat. The brother was very curt and replied, your cat died, and then hung up. For days, the man was inconsolable. Finally, he phoned his brother again to point out, it was needlessly cruel and sadistic of you to tell me so bluntly that my poor cat had passed away. The brother demanded, well, what do you expect me to do? He said, well, you could have broken the bad news to me gradually. First, you could have said, the cat was playing on the roof. Later, you could have called to say, he fell off. The next morning, you could have reported that he had broken his leg. Then when I came to get him, you could have told me that he passed away during the night. But you didn't have to have it in you to be that civilized. Now tell me, how's mom? 
The brother pondered momentarily and then announced, she's playing on the roof. <laughs> now, the reality is, though we can smile at that, is the tongue has incredible power, doesn't it? And it's not an easy thing to tame, is it? It's very easy to say things when others are not present about them, not really intending to say anything too bad, but it's easy to get caught up in the moment and allow the tongue to start expressing things about others that is just not what Scripture calls us to do. And this is very emphatic. James doesn't mince his words here. And this has such relevance to us, this church, right now, and certainly over the past year, such relevance. Because James brings a word to us about how we talk about one another outside of the context in which we find ourselves this evening. And when he talks and he says to us in verse 11 and 12, the command against malicious judging, 11 and 12, listen to what he says. Brothers, so this is talking to the church now, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Now here. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. And James is very strong at this point. And the imperatives from the previous section continue into this section for this first verse. Not for the verses that follow, but for this verse. In other words, this is a command against malicious judging. A command against malicious judging. He literally says, do not say anything bad or evil against a fellow believer. Here he uses the imperative mood, meaning a command, but he uses the present tense. Now, I know I've said this before. For those of you who've been here a while, you already know this, so you can switch off for a short time. I'll tell you when to switch on again. For those of you who haven't heard me say this, you need to stay awake. In the Greek tenses, they don't function the same way as English. Present tense in the English means something is happening now. I am presently preaching to you. The words I've just said are now in the past. In the Greek, the tenses don't work on time. They work on action. So the emphasis in the te present tense in the original language is on continual action when it's the present. In other words, he's saying this is something habitual that is happening in your midst. You keep on talking about one another behind one another's backs when you are outside of the church, when you are fellowshipping together with your friends, whether it's over a cup of coffee, whether it's over lunch, whether it's in their home. You are talking about others in the church in a way that is not fitting for the Christian while they are not present and you are doing it continually. That's what he's saying. The term that he uses there for slander is used elsewhere in Scripture, and it's used of unbelievers who persecute Christians. So, for example, in 1 Peter 2 verse 12, he uses it in this way, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you, same word, of doing wrong. So here are the unbelievers accusing, slandering Christians of doing wrong. Same word as used in James. Again, uh, he uses it in 1 Peter 3, 16. Keeping a clear conscience so those who speak maliciously against your good behavior. Same word, except now it's the unbelievers. Now what's happening in the context of the church is James is saying you are acting like unbelievers. You are engaging in the same activity they engage in, for you are doing exactly what they do. There are four aspects to the slander that he speaks about here. Four aspects. Firstly, it is willful false accusation. So there are false accusations being made against people that have no basis of truth. Does that sound familiar? Lies are being said about people in the church. Second, there's exaggeration 
of real faults. So here people are saying, I don't like X, Y, and Z about so-and-so. It may be a fault that they have. It may be a weakness that they have. And now they are exaggerating those faults. They are highlighting them, bringing them to the surface. Third, it says, gives needless repetition of those faults. So it's not just a once-off, but it needlessly repeats the real faults that people have and loves to talk about it in the company of others. And number four, it is slander, straight out slander. Criticism, slandering, speaking bad of people behind their backs, saying things that are nasty about them and delighting in pulling them down behind their backs. James says, no place in God's church for that kind of talk, period. Notice how he frames it in terms of what this means in respect of the law. So those who engage in this activity through false accusations, through lies being spread around, through misinformation about people, through exaggeration about their faults, even though they are real faults because they just don't like them, James says when you act like that, you are in fact standing as a judge over the law. Now the question we need to ask is what law is James talking about? And that's not an easy question necessarily to answer. But it is most likely the law that is found in Leviticus 19 verse 18 and then repeated by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 22:39. And also backwards to the reference of the royal law and the law of love that James has already spoken about in chapter 1. What is Leviticus um, 18, uh, sorry, Leviticus 19, verse 18? Let me read that to you. I just need to look it up. I thought I had it on my sheet again. I'm going, I'm getting bad at this. Leviticus 19, verse 18 reads as follows. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus repeats that in Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine, 39, where he says, And the second, so the first command is, Love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is, Love your neighbor as yourself. So the law he speaks about is a love that believers must have for each other and a love that is the same kind of love that is demonstrated by Jesus. It's the love that Peter speaks about that covers over a multitude of sins. In other words, it is a very wide, it is a broad love that overlooks the faults of people, that doesn't focus on being critical of people we don't like because of certain things they do and the way that they act and certain intrinsic weaknesses to their personality. It doesn't do that. Thus, when a believer makes an evil judgment against one another, when it makes those kinds of, expresses those kinds of opinion, what it means is we are standing now and judging that law of love the neighbor as a bad law. We are condemning the law. In other words, we are standing in the place of God who James says to us is the lawgiver. Listen to his words. I'm not making this up. Listen to his words when he says, there is, uh, when you judge the Lord, are you not keeping the Lord but singing judgment on? There is only one capital lawgiver and judge. In other words, if it is God Almighty who gives the law, now we as the human beings are standing and judging the law in effect what James is saying you are judging God's wisdom in the law that he has given. You are standing in judgment of God. Do you hear that? You're not just standing in judgment of your fellow believer. That you are. But now you are standing in judgment of God. You've put him on the dock.
And thus he outlaws all form of judgment on that basis. James insists the only person who has the divine right to make judgment cause on the law is the lawgiver, is God himself. He alone has insight that you and I do not have. He alone looks into the depths of a human heart. He alone is able to expose all that lies below. He alone knows the motives of a person. He alone is able to discern every single thought that every person has. You and I don't have that ability. Only God does. And therefore, he's the only one who has the right to make those kinds of judgments against people. We don't. Psalm 44 verse 21 makes the following comment. Would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of the heart? You do not know the secrets of my heart. I do not know the secrets of your heart. But they are exposed before God. You hide nothing. Or Romans 2 verse 16. Paul writing to the Roman church makes the following comment. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. Thus James condemns his readers for judging their neighbors, condemns them for judging whether or not they are even keeping the law, whether or not they are in or out the faith, whether or not they are Christians or not Christians. At the end of the day, even though we may suspect a person through lack of fruit in their lives is not showing signs of being a Christian, at the end of the day, only God knows. For he is the one who saves. And though James makes that clear, doesn't he? Look at verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Here is the one who stands in judgment over and against humanity. He calls humanity to judgment. And he will cause each person one day to stand and give an account before him. And the only hope that humanity has to escape the judgment of God is to trust in the one who has been judged on their behalf, who is Jesus Christ, whom God has passed judgment against on the cross, who has been judged for the sin of all those who trust in him, and therefore is able to save to the uttermost ends of the earth those who are saved, those who are in Christ, those who have found salvation in him. One day we'll stand before God and Jesus will step up on their behalf and he will declare them innocent. But all others will stand and face the judge of all the earth who will expose the secrets of the heart of those who do not follow him. Acts 17 verse 31 says, God commands all people everywhere to repent and then goes on to say, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with his justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. James wants to eliminate from the church any harsh, unkind, spirit of criticism that exists, where people have been defamed, where people take delight in finding fault with others and delight in talking about those faults they find in others behind the person's back. James says, if you act like that, you haven't understood the law of love and you are standing in judgment of God and his law. 
You know, as, as I was preparing for this, one of the commentators in the Bible Speaks Today series is quite helpful in that he gives lots of illustrations of this happening. And this is what he wrote in his commentary on this particular verse. And there were about four or five different examples he gave. And this is him writing, David Nystrom. During the next 15 years, as I served in local churches, I witnessed astounding acts of Christian devotion and selfless service done with integrity and sacrifice. That is so true. We've seen it at this church. But I also witnessed evidence of another kind. Early on, I watched as a plot hatched by some volunteers was set in motion. Their plan included ill talk, half truths, and misinformation concerning a pastor, which eventuated in his removal. They executed their strategy with precision and granted it to a veneer of spirituality, claiming to be acting for the good of the church. These volunteers were privy to various planning meetings, and virtually all the decisions made by the pastor in question never disagreeing with them openly. But as soon as the meetings were over, they sped, spread their vitriol to others. Questions were raised in secret about the wisdom of the decisions made, and subtle hints were left con concerning the misuse of funds. These charges were without foundation but the effect was the same. And then he gives story after story after story. It doesn't matter whether it's the pastor. It doesn't matter whether it's a fellow Christian sitting in the pew. It makes little difference. It doesn't matter whether it's a deacon or an elder or the leader of rocks or play group or our children's worker. It doesn't matter. James says there is no place in the church for an unkind, critical, slanderous spirit. No place in the church to defame others. No place in the church not to act in love. This is a community that should be marked by its love. It should be marked as different from the community out there. And when people walk through these doors, they should be able to walk into an environment where they know with absolute certainty no one's going to talk behind their backs about them. No one's going to speak unfairly and criticize them. No one's going to talk maliciously behind their backs. No one is going to spread false lies about them. That's the kind of environment every church should witness and be practicing. So let me ask you some hard questions here. Is there someone you've told a lie about in this church? Is there someone you need to go to and say, I'm sorry, I've said X, Y, and Z, and I've realized I should have never said it. Criticized you harshly, I've criticized you unfairly. I've spoken behind your back, and I need to repent. It's hard to do that. It's very hard to do that. Otherwise, God's word just goes in and out and means nothing unless it's applied. So does this have application to you? Secondly, I want you to notice the caution against presumptuous boasting, verses 13 to 16. The caution against presumptuous boasting, verse 13. Now, you, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city, uh, this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Let me just pause there for the moment. Now, what's going on in this context is you've got some businessmen in the church. And these businessmen have become obsessed with making money. And so they're spreading their influence beyond the city in which, to, or the city in which this church resides. 
And they're seeking to expand their business opportunities outside of the city. And so they make these plans without any reference to God whatsoever. It's as if God is completely absent from the conversation. And they've become so obsessed with making money and becoming rich and enjoying all the things that come with wealth that they are making plans and deciding where they're going to make more and more money. In other words, they've become overwhelmed by greed. It has become the motivating factor for them. And so they make four presumptions. First presumption, we will go. They presume that they will be in a position to actually go somewhere to travel. And yet God says, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. How can you make such a boast? Second presumption they make, we will spend a year in that city. Now they're presuming upon God that God will enable them to be successful in their business ventures in whatever city they're going to, and they will remain there a year and stay alive. Third presumption, they are doing business. Our business will continue on in these cities. We will happily go about our business without there being any negative effects for the business that we are planning to engage in in that city. And the fourth presumption is we will make lots of money. They are seeking to make more and more profits. And the underlying problem here that James addresses is say, he says to them, you are so arrogant. How do you know that any of that will actually occur? What makes you think that you have the power within yourself to cause all of that to eventuate. The underlying problem is one of arrogance, of one of thinking that everything is dependent upon them, that they have the power in and of themselves to make all of this happen. And James cuts right across that and says, no, you are dependent entirely upon the sovereignty of God. Don't presume to think that God is obliged in some way to preserve your life just because you've made definite plans to go ahead and do something. Now, I want you to understand that the planning that is going on here is not that God is saying don't plan for the future, but what God is saying is don't plan without taking God into account in the future. In other words, when you make your plans for the future, make sure that you are factoring in God. Make sure that you are doing it humbly before God. Make sure you are doing it in recognition that everything is dependent upon God's goodness and grace for you to accomplish the things that you are wanting to accomplish. It's not against planning. But they've removed God from the picture. For all their presumptions, they have zero control over the future. They cannot effect it. They cannot enable it to occur. And here they are thinking that somehow they are more powerful than they what are. Their first problem is they are ignorant. They are ignorant of God's sovereignty. They are ignorant because they cannot know with any degree of certainty what God has planned for them in the future. No one knows what God has planned in the future. And so it's that ignorance that drives them to making these presumptions. Proverbs 27 verse 1 says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. The fact that you and I will, God willing, wake up tomorrow is dependent upon God's grace. And though you and I may plan, for example, holidays in the future, all of those will only occur in God's grace and according to God's sovereignty. The second problem is that they presume they don't understand the uncertainty of human life, how quickly life changes. I've often said to people that in the moment, in the second, your life can change dramatically. Just one second. I could be standing here preaching to you and in the next moment have a heart attack and my life would be changed like that. I don't know if you've seen some of these videos going around of these elite sportsmen who have been on the soccer field or on the basketball court and who are training or in a game and suddenly you just see them collapse. And they collapse because they've had a heart problem and they just fall to the ground. And in that second, 
their life is radically changed. And so James illustrates this. Listen to what he says. Why, you do not even, verse 14, you do even not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Isn't life like that? Even if you live to 100, and I can confidently say in my, all my pastoral experience that maybe 5% of you here this evening will live to 100, probably less. But even if you live to 100, what is 100 years in view of how old the earth currently is? It's a drop in the ocean. Life passes by ever so quickly. And I know some of you are younger here. And you're sitting here at 17 or 18 or 19 or 22 or however old you might be. And you might say, no, 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 I'm so young. I've got all of this that lies ahead of me. None of you can say with certainty whether or not you do have what lies ahead of you. And even if God should spare you to old age, it goes so quickly. So very quickly, I remember at age, I'll give you two examples, at age 18, going to a young adult event the church had organized, and there was a man there who was 29, and as an 18-year-old, I stood there and I looked at him, I thought, what are you doing here? This is young adults, you're 29, you need to be somewhere else. And then I went to a 50th birthday party when I was 26, 50th. And I remember turning to a friend of mine saying, listen, maybe you should buy a walking stick for the old man. 50, and then 50 came. And I thought to myself, where did that come from? James Dobson, in one of the most moving talks he gave, it's on video, it's called A Father Looks Back, talks about the passage of time how quickly the passage of time disappears. And he says, he, he, when he did the video, he is about 43 years old. He said, when my dad turned, it was 63 or 64, somewhere around there, he had a massive stroke that took his life. And James Dobson said, I'm 43. I'm two-thirds of the way there. And if the same thing happens to me at the same age, I've got a third of my life left. When James Dobson got into his 60s, he too had a stroke. He survived it, but he had a stroke, just like his dad. Let me tell you, young people, it goes very fast. I say to people like Tom with dedicating Myra, you'll blink and you'll be walking it down the aisle. That's how quickly it goes. And there are no guarantees that you will last or make 50 or make 40 or make 30. When Emily Apostolos was 17 and went to bed on the eve of her 18th birthday, she never woke up. She died in her sleep. Never made 18. You just don't know. And it's very sobering because God reminds us how frail life is. And God gives no guarantees in terms of how long you and I will live. He doesn't say that you're going to live to a ripe old age. Thank goodness he doesn't tell us the number. Imagine if God revealed to you at age 10 that you were going to die at age 15. It wouldn't be very pleasant, would it? God doesn't tell us. Thank goodness. But whatever the case is, your life is like a mist. It's a breath. Before you know it, it's gone. Remember, Job, in chapter 7, remember, O oh God, that my life is but a breath. 
my eyes will never see happiness again. Or Psalm 39 verse 5. You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my years is, not, is nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Man is a near, mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. Or the parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 12 of the rich man. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my grain and all my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Think superannuation. Take life, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? Which highlights the need to make sure that you know where you're going when you die. Because you cannot determine when that day will occur, but it's coming. It's coming. Make sure that your eternal security is in the bank. Make sure you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't go to a grave with uncertainty in your mind. Romans reminds us, 10 verse 9, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then you are saved. Have you confessed your sin? Have you repented of it? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Is your salvation secure? If God were say, to say to you tonight, is the night I'm coming for you, would you be ready? So what should the attitude be? B, he tells us, doesn't he? Instead, verse 15, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, all such boasting is evil. Now, I want you to understand what he's not saying here. He's not saying that every time we think about going away on a holiday or think about something we've planned in the future, that we just tack on the saying, if it's the Lord's will, if it's the Lord's will. Or sometimes people put in emails, DV. Have you seen the DV? It's Latin. If the Lord wills. It's not about that kind of superficial stuff. Because anyone can do that. Rather, it's about a heart attitude. An attitude that recognizes Every single breath it draws is completely dependent upon the grace of God. And a person lives his life or their, her life in a way that says, whatever I am going to do, whatever lies ahead, all is contingent upon God's grace. All is dependent upon Him. I'm not so foolish or stupid to think that somehow I am the master of my own destiny. I am the captain of my soul because you're not. God is. And it's living daily with that kind of a framework in the way you speak, in the way you live, in your behavior in the things that you do, in all your planning, all of it always takes God into consideration. In other words, there is no place for living independently of God. There's no place of excluding God from one's life in any area. There is no place for boasting about things you have planned, for they are all dependent upon God. So let me ask you, is that how you function? 
Are you deeply conscious day by day, moment by moment, that everything you do is contingent upon God's generous, amazing grace? And then thirdly, and I'll just briefly mention this, the caution against ignoring truth. Verse 17. There is, uh, sorry, verse 17. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Hear that? What is the good? Well, he's told them, yeah, what the good is. But there's a broader reference here to the good. And that is the caution against ignoring truth because it is the truth that is found in the word of God that teaches us how we are to live, how we are to behave. How we are to bring our lives into submission to the word of God, to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And there are things that we are commanded to be and commanded to do. And so James says, if you know the truth, if you know what God requires and what God has revealed, and you fail to act in a way that is consistent with the word of God, you are acting in sin. That's deeply confronting, don't you think? You see, we think about the sins of commission. We think about the sins of, you know, when we lie or when we do things that we regret, when we lose our temper, whatever the case, we think about those kinds of sins. But do you think about the sins of omission? The things that God has called us to do, called us to be, that we don't do in spite of the fact that he's revealed it in his word. And we know better. That's what he's saying. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. So let me ask you again. Do you stand and sit here this evening as one who has neglected doing the good that God has revealed in his word? Do we neglect reaching out to the lost? Do we neglect praying, which is commanded? Do we neglect serving Christ? Do we neglect encouraging one another, building one another up in the faith as we are called to do? Do we neglect showing joy in our lives because of our relationship with Christ? Do we neglect speaking kindly to one another? Do we neglect looking for ways in which we can serve those who can't make it to church because they're too frail to get into a car and drive? Do we neglect visiting those who are stuck at home and can't get out and encouraging them through our visitation? It's very comprehensive, isn't it? But don't you want to belong to a church like that? Where you know you are deeply loved. Where you know that you are cared for. Where that you know people are there to help you, to assist you, are there for your good. Where they speak well of you. Where they encourage you, pray for you, build you up. Isn't that the kind of church we all want to be part of? That, says James, is the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, by God's grace, endeavor to show the world out there what the true church looks like in here.
Our Father, we thank you for your word that speaks into the very depths of our being. Where we have erred, where we have said unkind things or untrue things about others, forgive us, we pray. Give us the courage to make right with those we have said untrue things about. Where we have not done the good we have commanded us to do, give us the insight to know where we can start doing those things and be more proactive in them. Help us never to tire of doing good. Strengthen us by your spirit to do good. Help us to live in such a way that we constantly acknowledge our dependence upon you. May we never do anything without taking you into consideration. May our whole lives be lived in submission and dependence upon you. May we glory in the Lordship of Jesus Christ in all things. And if there be any here who don't know you, whose salvation is not secure, O oh God, call them to yourself, I pray. Open their eyes before it's too late and bring them into a relationship with you. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand as we